that constantly impresses me is the variety of the Christian East. The Christian East is truly a unity in diversity. We have not only the family of Byzantine Orthodox churches, not only the Greek Catholics, we have also the Oriental Orthodox churches, the non-Chalcedonian churches, the Copts, the Armenians, the Ethiopians, the Syrian Orthodox. But beyond that, there is another church of great antiquity with a rich theological tradition of which we hear far too little. And that is the Church of the East, often called Assyria. It's a great joy and privilege for our Conference Orientale Lumen for the second time to have with us a bishop of that church, Mar Bawai Soro. The Assyrian Church of the East represents, as we know, particularly the tradition of Antioch in Christology, in scriptural exegesis. It holds in high honor Theodore of Mopsuestia, the interpreter, as he is known. But the Church of the East also produced a mystical theologian deeply loved by the Greeks and the Slavs, St. Isaac of Nineveh. All too often we don't have the opportunity to listen to members of this church, but Mabarwai is a bridge builder. We can truly call him Pontifex, if not Maximus, at least Pontifex Manius. He has studied in Rome, he will shortly be completing his doctorate there. He is now a bishop for the Assyrian Church of the East in the Diocese of Western California. And he is going to speak on the title of our conference, Eucharist, a Prayer for Unity. Marvawa. Good morning, everyone. Last year, when the theme of the fourth Orientale Lumen Conference was announced as the Eucharist Prayer for Unity, I decided to choose this very theme without any diversion as the topic for my talk. And so, this morning I shall share with you some insight from the Church of the East's theological understanding and liturgical practice that illustrates how and why the Eucharist ought to be held with the strongest conviction as that which will transform the followers of Christ and move them from divisions to unity and from mutual suspicion to mission. <clears throat> Indeed, proclaiming in a literal sense the statement that the Eucharist is surely and literally a prayer for unity. I have divided my presentation into three parts. Part one will deal with the Pauline concept that God has reconciled us to himself in Jesus Christ. In part two, I shall attempt to synthesize some of St. Ephraim's Eucharistic concepts with certain theological elements in the anaphora of Addai and Mary so that we can further discern one of the earliest meaning of the Eucharist which persists, which exists in the Church of the East. I will, in the last part of the talk, share with you some insights on the consequence of continuing to celebrate the Eucharist as divided churches. In his second letter to the Corinthians, Paul writes, whoever 
is in Christ, is a new creation. All things have passed away, and everything has been made new by God. Who has reconciled us to himself in Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation? For it was God in Christ who was reconciling the world to, him, to his greatness, not counting their sins against them, and ensuring to us our own message of reconciliation. So we are ambassadors for Christ. And as God is beseeching you through us, so we, on behalf of Christ, make supplication be reconciled to God. In Paul's mind, this metaphor of reconciliation does not in any way refer to a change of sentiments on the part of human beings or on the part of God, but to an inner change in the depth of humanity's relationship to God. Humanity's reconciliation with God is its justification by God, because to reconcile means to end a relationship of enmity and to substitute for it one of peace and benevolence. For those who have received a ministry of reconciliation, Paul sets forth the criteria for the fulfillment of a task he calls an ambassadorship, which is given freely by God. It is a purifying grace bestowed on individuals and their churches. Similarly, the apostle affirms that when he is at work in carrying out this ambassadorship, it is not Paul who speaks, but God. In St. Paul's words to the Galatian, I live now, not I, but Christ lives in me. But since the message of reconciliation entrusted to Paul is the same as that committed to our churches, and since it is effectively exercised in the ministry of the word and sacraments, in which Christ mediated presence is both the guarantee and the source of its effectiveness, then, following the model of Paul, we must have the boldness to preach this life-giving gospel, to set out men and women on the course of reconciliation with God and in Christ with one another. The activity of reconciliation is the ultimate objective for which the church's ministry is established. And her mandate to evangelize is grounded in it. Reconciliation with God guides the church's life and service to the world and calls her sons and, daughter, her sons and daughters to unity and to reconciliation with one another. According to Paul, such cooperation with God and unity with the human family is possible because our Lord Jesus Christ has overcome death, the alienation between God and humanity, and has restored our fellowship with God. However, the gift of reconciliation, which God the Father has bestowed on the church through Jesus Christ, calls for a specific manner of life and action, which is, not be which is to be fulfilled in pious charity and the daily lives of all Christian individuals and communities. Some important elements which provide this divine donation with a concrete manifestation are gestures of reconciliation, concerns for the poor, fraternal cooperation, mutual admission of faults, spiritual direction, acceptance of suffering, endurance of persecution for the sake of righteousness, and lastly, taking one's cross each day and following Jesus. Whenever the church faithfully cultivated these virtues, she would be in a state of realized reconciliation with God, and her sons and daughters are graced and empowered to overcome divisions within the church.
But very early in the Christian history, when members of the church brought about divisions through pride and ambition, and ceased to reflect in a Christ-like way God's commands for an expectation of his people, the resultant disunity began to undermine the oneness, Catholicity, apostolicity, and holiness of the sons and daughters of the church. Abdishu of Suba, a 14th century Church of the East canonist and theologian, wrote the following on the causes of division in the early church. When the light of Christ's epiphany shone forth and scattered, it scattered the darkness of error from the face of the world by the preaching of these devout apostles. And the inhabitants of the world learned goodness, holiness, humility, and gentleness. And the lands were filled with knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Consequently, this reality filled Satan with envy and rage. And so, just as he has acted with Adam, he did with us. So that Christians rose up against each other and divisions and controversies sprang up among them. Today's division and the church are, are the resultants from ancient wounds inflicted upon the body of Christ. They arose from a lack of charity and from inattention to the need for ongoing conversion and reconciliation on the part of sons and daughter of the church. Pope John Paul in his 1994 apostolic letter on the preparation for the Jubilee for the year 2000 speaks about the church's continuous need for conversion as prerequisite condition for reconciliation with God on the part of both individuals and communities. The Roman pontiff states that the church must repent and do penance before God and man, always acknowledging the sinfulness of her own sons and daughters. This call to repentance find, finds its clearest voice and the preaching of Jesus in whose public ministry we hear the master calling us all to repent. The New Testament assuredly informs us that conversion is a fundamental moral decision, a change of mind which intends to commit the whole of human life to God so that by our turning away from sin and back towards him, we prepare the grounds for our personal reconciliation with God. Our God's provision of the forgiveness of sins gives us the opportunity to exercise our God-given freedom to stand against evil and overcome our own weaknesses. Conversion of mind and heart as a condition for reconciliation with God means that we will love our neighbor for only in this way can we truly love God. Without such love to others, no one can really know with genuine personal knowledge who God is. Through the sacred scripture, though the sacred scriptures tell us that God wills to save us and his love for us is unconditional, Yet we must always seize the moment of grace and recognize it as the here and now without presuming that this chance of salvation will always be available. To be converted is to live in daily fidelity to God, knowing that our conversion is a process that can only be realized in the end of a whole lifetime. As long as divisions in the church remain, 
it is incumbent on every Christian to recognize the need for ongoing conversion and to pray for the unity and reconciliation of all Christians. The need for ongoing conversion must be recognized and publicly acknowledged by all of us. But it is often implicitly or even sometimes explicitly denied by our actions. Behind every sin and the source of every fruit of evil that erects walls of alienation between God and man is willful pride. Pride is the opposite of goodness, humility and gentleness, and it prevents us from making gestures toward reconciliation and from admitting our faults to one another. It reverses the process began by our conversion, a process only begun in time and which must continue in order to prepare us for eternity. And it eliminates the very possibility of holiness in our life. And pride, humanity is deprived of the divine likeness which the Creator formed in human nature. Pride produces evil through human hands and becomes a vicious habit and a serious source of sin. Not only does it emerge in individuals, but unfortunately also in communities. And therefore, it is a danger for the church as well. Pride is an impulse which stands as a barrier to love for God and to the innocent and proper love for oneself and the world. In recent years, our various churches have been in dialogue and collaboration, gradually transforming the climate of inner and inter-church relations. Church ecumenists have shown us that by their willingness to function as effective ambassadors of Christ and ministers of reconciliation among a divided Christianity, the One Church of Christ continues to live in hope. Yet, in spite of the best effort of these good-minded and hearted leaders, Christianity has thus far been unable to resolve the divisions and conflicts between her differ differing communities. The question that arises in light of our Pauline text are these. Is there not a connection between this sobering picture of ecumenism and a failure to understand and fully exercise the ministry of reconciliation with which we have been commissioned? Do not the divisions and disunity of the church effectively negate the church's ability to advance the mission of Christ and his gospel to all nations? The answers I believe to both questions is yes. A, re a resuscitation and strengthening of vitality and hope in the church can take place only when there is a proper understanding of the nature of the church and the character of her relationship with Christ. I now move to part two. The Eucharist the fire that unites. The faith in the transforming effects of the Eucharist is the basis upon which genuine apostolic Christianity establishes her hope in the Eucharist as a vehicle of reconciliation and unity. In this sense, the Eucharist is a means of building solidarity among members of the faith community and affecting their union with God. Commentators on the sacraments of initiation in the Church of the East, among whom the most ancient and important is Saint Ephraim the Syriac, affirm such a faith and expresses such a hope. For Saint Ephraim, just as all humanity has been excluded from paradise through Adam's fall, and that he broke God's commandment and ate from the fruit of the tree of knowledge and good and evil in paradise, so too 
the newly baptized enter into the paradise of the community of believers in which he is now a partaker of communion in Christ. Christ who is the tree of life and the transformer of mortality into immortality. Through baptism, the initiate gains access to the Eucharist, the body and blood of Christ, which is the new fruit of the tree of life, giving of itself to all people and unifying them in the hope of immortality. By means of the spiritual bread, namely the Eucharist, everyone becomes an ego who can soar as far as the heavenly paradise. For Saint Ephraim, solidarity in faith acquires unity. Meantime, the community's effective hope for immortality through the reception of the Eucharist becomes the basis of and rationale for its own unity. Spiritual cleansing and sanctification through the purifying agent of fire is a biblical metaphor picked up by the fathers of the Church of the East to explain numerous events in the history of salvation. Making use of Isaiah's vision at the temple in Jerusalem, Saint Ephraim describes Christ as the coal of fire. In 1 King 1838, the descent of fire during Elijah's sacrifice is understood as a sign that God has accepted Elijah's prayer and sacrifici sacrificial offer, offering. Similarly, when Solomon had ended his prayer, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. Based on these Old Testament readings, just as the fire as a natural force burns up and consumes matter, so too the divine fire that is believed to be in the Eucharist burns and destroys sin and at the same time purifies and sanctifies the human heart and mind. Since sin is at the root of all divisions in the body of Christ, it must be dealt with through the cleansing fire within the Eucharist. In a New Testament setting, the concept of fire is more directly linked with the fathers with the fathers of the church to the presence of Christ in the Eucharist. An important parallelism between the presence of Christ in Mary's womb and his presence in the Eucharist is articulated in the following verse of St. Ephraim's hymn on faith. The call of fire which came to burn away thorns and thistles had dwelled in a womb refining and sanctifying that place of pangs and curses. Ephraim also writes, See fire and spirit in the womb of her who bore you. See fire and spirit in the river in which you were baptized. See fire and spirit in our baptismal font, and see fire and Holy Spirit in the bread and cup. On the one hand, in the Church of the East's order of the hallowing of the apostles Addai and Mari, the anamnetic prayer during the, Eucharistic, the Eucharist makes clear that the celebration of the gathered community of faith is an act of commemoration in accordance with Jesus' command, do this in memory of me. The anamnetic prayer of the Eucharist in the Church of the East's father, fathers has a pivotal importance for our discussion because in the act of worship, worshipful remembering, the community celebrating the Eucharist is necessarily united. In accordance with Christ's command to remember his once and for all sacrifice on the cross.
On the other hand, the Epiclesis has maintained its most ancient form and thus it continues to be a prayer, not for the consecration of the bread and wine, but for the consecration, sanctification, and transformation of those who will receive the body and blood of Christ. Because, unlike, unlike most of the epiclitic prayers that are still being used in Eucharistic anaphoras celebrated by Oriental, Byzantine, and Latin traditions, the epiclesis in the Addai and Mari hallowing does not pray for the change of the bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ, but instead it prays that the elements may become a source of sanctification for those who receive them. And I quote the, epic, the epiclesis and the anaphora of Addai and Mari. And may there come, O my Lord, your Holy Spirit, and may he rest upon this oblation of your servants. May he bless it and hollow it, and may it be for us, O my Lord, for the pardon of debts and forgiveness of sins, the great hope of resurrection from the dead, and for the new life in the kingdom of heaven with all who have been well-pleasing before you, and for all this great and marvelous dispensation toward us, we will give thanks to you and praise you without ceasing in your church, saved by the precious blood of your Christ with unclosed mouth and open face." End of quote. The Holy Spirit is invoked and bidden to descend, sanctify, and benefit the worshiping community just like the fire that descends upon Elijah's sacrifice and Mary's womb. All this is prayed for with eschatological anticipation, a participation in the messianic kingdom as the earthly community joins the heavenly choir in a hymn of praise. In this manner, the community receives the confident expectation of salvation, and its members are transformed into the body of Christ and the temple of the Holy Spirit. But such a spiritual change and conversion is not without serious after effects. The community of the church is now called upon to be a mediator of the word of God to the whole world. It is through the celebration and the reception of the Eucharist that ultimately the eschatological reality of the body and blood of Christ is revealed and realistically apprehended here and now in the Eucharist. It is in the Eucharist that the many become one and the one become many. The nature of the local church in the celebration of the Eucharist is revealed to be Catholic. The Gospel of John also emphasized this reality by the priestly prayer of Jesus in the upper room before his passion, death, and resurrection. The eschatological presuppositions of the Eucharist during the Last Supper are deeply connected with the eschatological unity with which, which Christ wills for his church that all may be one. Now I come to part three. A bride seeking comfort from her bridegroom. In 1924, Joseph Oldham, one of the pioneers of the ecumenical movement, is said to have made the following statement. As Christ was sent by the Father, so he sends his disciples to set up in the world the kingdom of God. Christ, Christ's mission was a declaration of war against death and the power of darkness. He was to destroy the work of evil. So when Christian churches 
who are the missionaries of Christ find in the world a state of reality that is not in accordance with the truth of the gospel which he has learned which we have learned from God their concern is not that it should be explained or understood but it should be overcome this inspiring statement should not at all cause us to dismiss the benefit of dialogue and debate among Christians themselves or between Christians and the world. But Oldham's point is well taken. Our attention needs also to be directed, not just toward explaining and understanding the evil and comfort, the evil that confronts the church today, but also toward overcoming it. The sin of pride and disordered love have brought warfare and disunity within the church for centuries. And they have proved so strong and tempting to the extent that they have deceived many of the church's sons and daughter and deluded them into offering God's love and the unity of the church. I'm sorry, uh, deluded them into offending God's love and the unity of his church. The church must seek the means to do the extraordinary, to transcend the artificial barriers thrown up because of the personal weaknesses of her children by calling her bridegroom, Christ Jesus, to be present with her and to assist her in waging war against the divisions among her, her people so that she, through her masters, eminent help may at last win her ages long struggle with sin and evil. How then ought we to do so? I would suggest that the church go to the texts of the New Testament and seriously consider two commands given by our Lord to his disciple during the final days of his, of his earthly ministry. Commands which devolved upon us through the mission entrusted to us. One, to celebrate the Eucharist in his memory. And two, to go and make disciples of all nations. What other means are there by which the church may encounter her Lord and Savior in the fullest sense of the meaning other than in fulfilling what he has directed his apostles and us to fulfill. Since the quest for Christian unity, informed and driven by the experience of our reconciliation with God, has been impaired by our disunity, we together, as the Church Bride of Christ, must call upon him to come and comfort his bride, and heal the wounds of his church, which is the people of God and the temple of the Holy Spirit. Yes, I am very humbly proposing, based on the liturgical practice of my tradition, that Christian faithful, whose churches hold the same apostolic faith in the Eucharist, should increasingly be allowed to receive together the Eucharist in order to invite and allow God's grace to heal their communal thinking, even as they, as one people, though divided but what, by whatever differences, gather around the table of the Lord and partake of the absolving and unifying grace by his gift to himself. Since by their contact with the Eucharist, Christians come into a vital dynamic union with the person of Christ to be identified with his with the uh, with the body of Christ is no longer a metaphor only grounded in speculative theology as baptism initiates us into the church the people of God so the eucharist renew, renews reunites and strengthen the body of Christ 
and deepens our incorporation into Christ, into Christ's body as his members. According to the theology of the Church of the East, every time the community of faith celebrates the Eucharist, the Spirit of Christ eschatologically restructures the worshiping community in a quite distinct and unparalleled way. In the Eucharist, the Church becomes a renewed and reconciled community that transcends social, ethnic, and racial boundaries and even natural divisions. For in Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female, adult nor child, rich nor poor, master nor slave. Just like the heavenly reality of the kingdom of God, the earthly church is revealed as a true sign through the Eucharist. The Eucharist becomes a sacrament of unity and the center of Catholicity, which is related to the eschatological kingdom awaiting fulfillment, but that is already here. And so we realize that the Eucharist manifests, defines, explains, and embraces the whole body of believers, which is the Church of Jesus Christ. By virtue of time available and the length of the text I have, I'm going to come closer to the I'll read two more paragraphs, unfortunately uh, dismissing the rest of the paper that further uh, collaborates on this. Let me explain, uh, cite a couple of examples on to exactly what is my intention, what is the uh, intention of the idea that I'm reproposing. Uh, I hope these two examples will add more clarity uh, to our dialogue uh, with one another. The effectiveness of Christ's presence among Christians of various apostolic churches who firmly believe in his real sacrificial Eucharistic presence despite their theological differences does not depend upon their ecclesiological agreement and unity. For in Christ himself who binds himself by his own, by his words and in his spirit to those who in faith call upon him in the Eucharist. The Jesuit theologian, Father Francis Sullivan, has made a similar argument. In his analysis of the claim, we see how the Eucharist brings the cause of Christian unity among the particular churches closest than anything else. He sets forth his argument in this manner. The one church of Christ exists not only when there is full ecclesial communion, but also when there are particular Christian churches that are linked together and the sharing of the same sacramental and Eucharistic life and in the sharing substantially of the same faith because the Church of God has to be understood as the communion of all those churches in which the Eucharist is validly celebrated, even though they are not all yet in full ecclesial juridical communion with one another. The early church was quick to recognize the, conciliar the conciliatory powers of Christ's presence in, this, in the Spirit through the Eucharist. For this reason, the celebration of the Eucharist was often called a love feast, agape. The prayer that Jesus prayed after the Last Supper, that they all may be one. As you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that all they may be one in us, become also a traditional part of Jesus' memorial as well as the affirmation that through the Eucharist the Church maintains her unity because of Jesus' promise, promise that he who eats my body and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. Thus, 
the Eucharist came to be seen as the food of union with Christ and with all Christians. Indeed, the food of reconciliation for all humanity. For in receiving the Eucharist, we partake in him who died, that he might gather into one the children of God who were scattered abroad. The early church expressed this thought very beautifully in her first Eucharistic and catechetical collection, which is called the Dedicae, dated about 100 AD, the document declares, as this broken bread was once scattered over the hillside, over the hillside, and then when gathered became one, so may your church be gathered from the ends of the earth into your kingdom. The bread has been put together from the scattered element of which it was composed. So the pious prayer expressed expresses the hope and expectation that we the scattered elements of which the church is composed may be united into one like the Eucharistic bread in the kingdom of God. The traditional position of the Catholic Church has been that the celebration of the Eucharist is a sign of the reality of the oneness of faith, life, and worship. The numerous proposals that have been set forth here encompass the idea that the Holy Eucharist is what establishes church unity by way of communicating God's grace to the church. The re realization of unity in a gradually evolving, is a gradually evolving process. The theology that sees the Eucharist as that which brings unity among Christians has partially been endorsed and the decision adopted by the United States Catholic Conference of Bishops. In the November 1996 Guidelines on Communion Reception, the U.S. bishops have indicated that according to Roman Catholic discipline, they have no objection to the reception of the Eucharist by members of the Orthodox Churches, the Assyrian Church of the East, and the Polish National Catholic Church if these Christians ask on their own accord and are pro properly disposed. The U.S. Bishop's statement adds, we pray that our common baptism and the action of the Holy Spirit and this Eucharist will draw us closer to one another and begin to dispel the sad divisions which separate us. We pray that these will lessen and finally disappear in keeping with Christ's prayer for us that they may be one. Since the code of canon law does not create a bar to the reception of communion by members of the Orthodox churches, the Assyrian Church of the East and the Polish National Church, the U.S. bishops have extended their invitation to these Christians to receive Eucharist hospitality in exceptional circumstances. And I'm not going to uh, read the, the other, uh, the, the conclusion of the paper based on uh, states uh, a prayer of some hopes uh, for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ma Bawai, for your talk. When I was ordained priest, I asked the bishop who ordained me for some counsel in the future exercise of my sacerdotal ministry. And he said briefly, always have three points in your sermon. So exactly, Mother Wai has followed that advice and has given us three points. When I was consecrated bishop, I asked the chief consecrator for his guidance 
in my future Episcopal ministry. And he said, always fold up your own vestments. <laughs> Don't let the deacons do it. They'll spoil. Whether my wife follows that advice, we don't know, and it would be impertinent for me to inquire. Thank you very much for that moving plea for unity. Again and again as you spoke, I felt that is exactly what I believe. The need for repentance with which you began was emphasized in the prayer of Father Sergei Bulgakov that we used at the liturgy yesterday, where we prayed for the spirit of love and repentance. And you've spoken very powerfully this morning of the Eucharist as the fire that unites. I hope we shall all take to heart what you've been saying. Now we'll follow our usual practice. We'll have a little break. Please don't leave the room unless you feel strongly guided to do so, but just talk with the people next to you. And then we will uh, resume in about five minutes for um, the discussion. As we are told in the Gospels, many are called but few are chosen. So I'm not able to present all the questions. And if I happen not to have chosen your particular question, please be forbearing about that. Now, not surprisingly, um, Many of the questions relate to what Ma Bawai was saying at the end concerning intercommunion, which continues to be a very sensitive topic for all of us. And so let's start with that. Um, here, the question asked by many people is put with particular clarity. What is the attitude in practice of the Assyrian Church to the 1996 U.S. Catholic Bishops' Guidelines? Does the Assyrian Church allow its faithful to receive communion in the Roman Catholic Church? And does it permit Catholics to receive communion in the Assyrian Church? Thank you. I think this is a, <clears throat> a very fair question, and uh, I think the idea expressed in my paper uh, represents only 10 to 15 percent of what is the actual practice in my church. Uh, in other words, uh, the reality uh, that exists in the Church of the East is much more advanced and developed from the proposals offered in the paper. And you may rightfully ask why. In my opinion, the reason why we have so much advanced Eucharistic, in this sense advanced, Eucharistic theology is because of the ecclesial isolation that my church comes from. Realize this, the more an ecclesial community is isolated and its theology is primitive, the more advanced it is. Why? Because during the first millennium, as Christian history evolved, there were controversies and there and the process of disunity began. It was culminated in the 11th century by the separation of East and West and then the separation of the Reformation churches. 
I belong to a tradition where since the fifth century somehow cut, was cut off of the rest of Christianity and politically we were isolated in the Persian Empire. So, as we, for all these centuries, lived out our faith, we could never comprehend uh, and not allowing other Christians who supposedly believe in the real sacrificial and truthful presence of Christ in the Eucharist to be welcome to the table. Our contention historically has been with our neighbors who were the uh, uh, Syrian Orthodox faithful. Because as you know, geographically, that's where we had the division, the, the Christological controversies. Probably, uh, the worst cases found in history, it would be to them that the fathers of my church would have denied communion. But now that, thanks to the ecumenical movement, that we know our faith is, is our Christological faith is essentially the same, and our Eucharistic faith continues because of the apostolic churches, the churches that stand in the apostolic succession, the virtue of that succession is the belief in the real presence of Christ. That is what is at the core uh, of, the, uh, of the faith. Uh, for those churches who believe in the real presence, my church does not have any problem in both inviting the faithful to receive communion and also we are often very much surprised when we go to other churches and ask to receive communion sometimes even knowing uh, uh, some of the sister churches when they know who we are we are refused communion and most of us did not know that Christians can be um, deprived of communion until we began to get in contact with the other churches in the 20th century. Uh, another example I may add to this, uh, our patriarchate uh, is in the process uh, to, of, of uh, negotiation with the Chaldean patriarchate to celebrate the uh, great jubilee uh, uh, in Iraq, both in Baghdad and in Mosul, the two historic places of uh, the Patriarchate of Seleucia Ktaisafan. And in our proposal, we asked, we, it was our own patriarch and bishops who asked, the, who proposed to the Chaldean Patriarch to be allowed to celebrate the communion together, knowing that what the Catholic teaching on that is, that's why we asked. We did not uh, automatically include it in the program. So the Chaldeans had to consult uh, both themselves and Rome, and unfortunately the answer was it may give mixed uh, messages to uh, other churches. Uh, we cannot do this uh, co-celebration of the Eucharist together while we don't have full agreement uh, on the constitution of the church, uh, especially for events on such big scale. Uh, and I suppose it is going to be a scandal for our own faithful when they see their patriarchs and patriarchates and bishops coming together in such a profound event and not celebrating the Eucharist together. Uh, I think this is a situation where culture plays a lot uh, uh, of influence and the involved history also plays a big role. Coming from a tradition that we did not, uh, because our separation is so old, we almost forgot all the reasons why we separated. It may not be the same. <laughs> It may not be the same with other churches. That's why uh, 
uh, in all prudence, I understand every criticism that is advanced to such a thesis. In fact, hearing the comments yesterday to His Excellency, uh, I was a little bit reluctant this morning to say what I was planning to say. But then again, I said I'm between brothers, and we have to be honest with one another. After all, we are here to dialogue. And we cannot only dialogue in niceties, but we have to say the truth of our faith. And I'm here not to do anything but to learn as to how to correct my thinking if I'm thinking in the wrong way. Thank you very much for what you've just said. This should be surely a starting point for our discussion that we do have different approaches to this very question of intercommunion. And we've got to bring those into the open and discuss them with uh, honesty and with generosity. So um, I'm very glad you did say what you said. Um, Yes, a slightly different question, but it ties in with what you've just been saying. Um, comment on the relatively recent agreement of Mar Dinka the Fourth and Pope John Paul the Second, leading to a fuller sense of communion between the two churches. Now. It will help us, I think, if you tell us about this agreement. I understand it was primarily on the question of Christology, because in the past, the West has considered that the Assyrian Church of the East was heretical in Christology, that it was Nestorian. Though whether Nestorius was a Nestorian is a... <laughs> question that needs to be looked at carefully. However, leaving Nestorius on one side, um, uh, let us, uh, perhaps you could tell us about this agreement and how it is relevant for the problem of intercommunion. Uh, our talks uh, with the Holy See began in 84. Uh, for 10 years there were preparation an unofficial conversation that culminated. A plan was devised, uh, and a culmination of the first step took place in 1994. The plan calls for a process of dialogue in three stages. One is to discuss and agree on the substance of the faith, Trinitarian Christological faith, which basically uh, was done in 94 by the virtue of the common Christological declaration signed by the Holy Father uh, and His Holiness Martin Chad IV. Um, stage number two has been taking place for the last five years. And every November, uh, October, November of each year since 1995, uh, a mixed committee meets and we have been discussing the ways of how do we live the faith that we have agreed upon. Namely, what, are, uh, uh, what is the sacramental nature of uh, our Christian life in both churches. And I hope I am at the liberty to say that in one or two years, uh, another statement, it is hoped, that uh, will come out uh, dealing with the sacramental life in our churches. Uh, the reason why we chose uh, sacramental life instead of sacrament, sacraments is, as you know, in the Church of the East, uh, historically, uh, during the 13th century, when all Christianity began to compose lists of sacraments, uh, we had uh, a theological debate, uh, debate, as in every church, uh, but f because of the Mongolian invasion, a certain list became the official list of the uh, Church of the East. And in that list, which belongs to Abdisho of Suba, the church father that I cited speaking about how 
uh, Christianity and why Christianity was divided. And that list, uh, two sacraments that, has, that are accepted by the rest of Christians are not, did not make it into our list, namely the sacrament of marriage and the sacraments of anointing of the sick. Although we have both liturgical practice, practices exactly in the same theological sense that both the East and the West have. So uh, we are dealing with the nature of sacramental life and we, are, we surprised ourselves very much into the level of profound agreement and uh, conformity and harmony that exists between the two churches. Having finished, after we finish the second phase, hopefully, there is one problem, uh, and that is uh, interestingly related uh, to the question of the Eucharist celebrated in our church. I'll come to that in a minute. Uh, after we finish phase number two, the dialogue will enter phase number three. Uh, this outline is already present in the Common Christological Declaration. And namely, phase number three is uh, we will begin to discuss the constitution of the church. Now that we agreed on the faith, and then we agreed on how we live that faith in the sacraments, now then how we are churches, how are we related, how do we govern ourselves as churches. And of course, in that debate, the question of primacy, the uh, integrity and dignity of our own particular patriarchate will be discussed uh, in relationship to the primacy and the ministry of unity and service of the, of the Bishop of Rome um, as it has been the agenda in, in many ecumenical dialogues. Uh, concerning the Eucharist, there is one issue that is uh, still under discussion. I'm trying to be very careful and not to say more than that is needed. Um, as you know, uh, and um, uh, many of you um, may know that, in the anaphora of Adai and Mari, the anaphora that I cited, uh, which is the most frequently used anaphora in our uh, church, uh, there is no words of institution. And the reason why there is no words of institution, of course, scholars from, and historians for many years have been uh, saying and elaborating and explaining on this, but apparently there really was no words of institution in the anaphora, unlike some other uh, opinions that they said it was said by heart or it was dropped off or uh, what have you, because of its primitive nature and of its different approach than how the Latin and probably the Byzantine anaphoras approach the whole concept of Eucharistic celebration. Uh, the anaphora maintains mainly on doing what Jesus has commanded us to do instead of, let's say, saying what Jesus or repeating what Jesus said to us. Although the words of institution, despite the fact that they are not explicitly mentioned, but they are mentioned in an implicit way, and they are scattered uh, all over the anaphora. Uh, and this question has occupied, uh, uh, has been occupying, in fact, for years now, uh, our dialogue. And uh, there's a very serious, continued discussion about it. And uh, so far, uh, uh, we are still waiting to see what the result of, of this uh, situation will be. Pretty much, if uh, this question is resolved, I think, in my opinion, it will have a direct contribution to the uh, question of Eucharistic hospitality uh, between the Catholic Church and the, to further that hospitality between the Catholic Church and uh, the Assyrian Church of the East. I'm sorry to have uh, taken uh, so long in answering the question, but I, wa I wanted to give uh, a somewhat detailed answer. In fact, your answer has covered some of the other questions.
here's a slightly different question. Um, how often do members of the Church of the East receive communion? Is it their custom to receive communion normally at every celebration of the Eucharist? Or do they only do so after special preparation through fasting and confession? Now, this question, I think, is relevant to the matter of intercommunion. I am, was brought up in the form of the Orthodox tradition, which on the whole has infrequent communion. And when I was a layman, I never myself received communion without first having confession. And so I didn't go to communion more than about once a month or once every six weeks. And when I'm in the, my monastery at Patmos, the liturgy is celebrated frequently, but I would not have communion normally at each liturgy. Therefore, I am very accustomed to non-communicating attendance at the Eucharist. That, however, is not the experience of many Christians. And it's often been put to me that the Orthodox don't mind attending a Catholic Mass at which they don't have communion because they're perfectly familiar with not having communion. <laughs> but for those Christians who normally do receive communion at every celebration, it is a far harder thing to be told you cannot have communion. So I wondered what was the practice of the Church of the East in this matter? Uh, our practice uh, is, has been, uh, we receive communion frequently. In fact, um, we go to church in order to receive communion. Um, recently, many people go to church also to hear the sermon. And we get nervous for two reasons. One, because uh, not that we mind good preachers in our churches, <laughs> no, uh, but because we sort of are uh, evolving into what is different from before. And not different in something insubstantial, but different in the relationship, the mystical relationship and the spiritual effect of communion. Although it is true that the communion, I, I have a concern in this aspect, Although it's true, and I, 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 can, I can see the insight behind the infrequent communion. I myself have always been an advocate of uh, preaching to my people to have that close relationship to the Eucharist. Yet, it is almost equally serious to be prepared to receive the Eucharist in order to see the effects in order, not that we do the effects by virtue of our knowledge and, and piety and holiness, no, far be it from that, but in order for us to be the correct vessels and, the, and, and, and accept and reciprocate and respond properly to the grace offered from God to us through the Eucharist. So understanding the meaning and preparing for, for it hopefully coupled with frequent reception, I think it is the, the ideal situation where a, a Christian community can have. Though a number of the Eastern churches have come to an agreement that they share essentially the same faith, there still remains the question of who is considered a saint and who is a heretic by the respective groups. How do you think we can best overcome this obstacle to reconciliation and shared communion? Now, I might just illustrate that from the experience of the Archbishop of Canterbury's mission to the Assyrian Church at the end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th century. Some of you may know about this mission. It was a very remarkable mission because it had as its basic principle that the Anglicans would not proselytize in any way from the Assyrians, that they would not accept a single 
a Syrian Christian into the Anglican Communion. And I think in the history of Christendom, there have been very few missions which have followed such a generous policy. We can think of plenty of examples to the contrary. Now, however, the Anglicans used to print things for the Assyrians. They had a great problem when printing the text of the liturgy of Adai and Mari because it was against their conscience to print the name of Nestorius. So eventually there had to be a compromise. They left a blank space in the printed text and the Assyrian Christians could then write in the name Nestorius for themselves. Now, would you like to comment on how we should handle this today? In uh, the dialogue that uh, the Church of the East had between 90, one, 1991 and 1995 with the Middle East Council of Churches, as we were attempting to enter into membership uh, of the region, uh, by the way all the Christian churches both uh, from uh, Eastern Orthodox, Oriental Orthodox, uh, Roman Catholics in 1990 after 1990 and all Protestant churches are member of that council except uh, our church and we were in dialogue uh, to become member this question was brought up and uh, in discussion uh, we came to see an insight, uh, I'm sure it has been said elsewhere in a more official way, the late uh, uh, Franciscan André du Alou uh, sort of presented, uh, who was a part uh, as an expert on behalf of the Middle East Council of Churches in dialogue with the Assyrian Church, uh, proposed a method. And his thesis was, uh, let us first distinguish between doctrine and person and the question of uh, church fathers that are condemned as heretics. And let us condemn, if there is enough evidence, excuse me, the second step was this, if there's enough evidence to see that, for example, Nestorius, and, and, and in fact the case was about Nestorius, if there's event, uh, enough evidence uh, to see that Nestorius is held in two different positions, just like he is in the Assyrian church held with honor because of their own reference, let's say friendly sources, that bring Nestorius in their memory as an orthodox person, and at the same time Nestorius is held as a heretic by the other churches, as you know, by the rest of Christianity, uh, and the example offered uh, uh, here now to us is, is a proof of that. Even the friendly churches as the Anglican during the 19th century were reluctant to endorse that. Uh, and that, uh, uh, that opinion of Nestorius was due to the unfriendly sources that the church has about him, then in Dualu's word, where we have a controversy in our hand. And in order to resolve that controversy, uh, let's not impose on the Assyrians to condemn Nestorius because in their own good conscience, they have, they attribute orthodox views to him. But to safeguard ultimately the church, and her teachings, let's all of us agree in condemning the heresies attributed to Nestorius. So this was the compromise that unfortunately uh, was not accepted by the Middle East Council of Churches. And therefore, uh, there was some time where we were accepted as members, but two years ago, we were asked to leave. Uh, the the council. It's a bitter reality uh, that uh, explains as a commentary of the Christian condition. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, I think it is uh, 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 it should be an opportunity for us to continue 
going into the mystery of church's unity in order to find new approaches and new ways and means to heal that very um, uh, very situation. So I hope uh, uh, what has been said uh, is uh, uh, one last point. We would never think of imposing on any one church that they accept uh, Nestorius or Theodore as saints. The only thing that we uh, have maintained in our discussions with other churches is please do not impose on us what we cannot in good conscience accept. You don't have to follow that uh, and you have to respect the Church of the East tradition being an apostolic church that we too have our own way of looking at things and ultimately we should leave the judgment of persons uh, to God but we can uh, eliminate and condemn and remove every heretical teaching that is, uh, uh, that is available and could be a threat to the orthodoxy of the church. It is exactly 12 o'clock, so I'm afraid the moment has come to close our discussion and to adjourn for lunch. On this very question of what to do about anathemas, there was an interesting proposal in the dialogue between the Byzantine and the non-Chalcedonian Orthodox, where it was suggested that each side should draw all the anathemas against the other side, but they would not immediately begin to commemorate as saints the people whom previously they had anathematized. There could be some time for growing together. So we on the Byzantine side would cease to anathematize Severus of Antioch. They on their side would cease to anathematize Pope Leo, but they wouldn't immediately each commemorate as saints but that uh, has not yet been carried into effect, in fact, by our churches. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mabawai, both for the broadness of vision in your talk, for the note of hope that you emphasized, and also for the very open spirit in which you dealt with all our questions. We are grateful. <laughs> Thank you.